Shabbat Shalom. So we're soon going to enter the um, uh, season of the, feel, uh, the fall feast that is of Israel, as found in Leviticus 23. Your next week is the Feast of Trumpet or Rosh Hashanah, and that symbolizes the rapture. Two weeks later, it's going to be Yom Kippur, which symbolizes the time of tribulation. This is the Day of Atonement. And a week after is the Feast of Tabernacle, which, is, which symbolizes the millennium. So they follow one, of it, one with the other. So you have the rapture, the tribulation, and then the messianic times. And these feasts could not come at a better time since in two weeks we'll begin our study of the Gospel of Luke, where we're going to see the life and the ministry of the Messiah as this, this is what is so well portrayed, by the way, in the feasts of Israel. So... This feast will be the best introduction of the gospel we could hope for. And today we come to our last study of Jeremiah, 52 chapters and 1,354 verses of pleading, of warning, of counsel, and many times of encouraging promises given over more than 40 years of hard work through much suffering and persecution endured by the prophet. In this book, we can see that more than through any other prophet, how God spoke his heart to the people. He saw where they were going to their destruction. He even so many times repeated his petition, but at the end, only a few listened. So Jeremiah is the story in a way of like of Noah's Ark, and now the doors are closing. And considering the whole body of uh, messages brought to us by Jeremiah, we can see this prophet standing at the very end of every prophecy of the end time. Even at the end of the book of Revelation, this world is about to experience. There Jeremiah stands, bringing us, and in a very special and passionate way, God's final words of warning before judgment strikes. I want to ask you something, what else could God have done? He sent his son to die for us. He delays the final judgment to thousands of years. Even now today we know that his spirit works nonstop in the heart of the unconverted to convict them, as the gospel says, of righteousness, of sin and judgment. He even leaves his own children, us, whom he saved, still in this world, so that they may also work to convict and warn. This is, I want to tell you, how big God's patience and grace is. All these years and those many words we found in Jeremiah are delays of grace. And it is especially through Jeremiah where we can see that God stretches this great grace to its maximum. Because after this, there's nothing he can do if man refuses. This book really brings us to the limits of man. Well, an eternity of love and grace is offered most humankind and fortunately will eventually refuse the offer. And again, that one thing that really stands out and is very touching is to see how God opens up himself to us in this book. You know, I, there's one thing that I learned from this book is that I know God better. I didn't know God the way I know him now that I finished this book than before. It is in this book where we can see, we can feel his pain and affliction caused by his love for men. We knew about this, but it is here where it stands out. Jeremiah, if you want, is like a large garden of Gethsemane, where God continuously suffers for men until comes a time where he must forget. The last chapter, chapter 52, is particularly moving. After the very constant presence of God seen before, there his absence is very much Felt. This last chapter relates to us the last minutes of the invasion by coldly listing for us all that the Babylonians took from the temple of God, the house of God, to show that God wasn't there anymore. You can feel, you can, he can see his absence. Let, let us go to chapter 52. We're going to read verses eight, just 18 and 19. I want to tell you that behind these apparently ordinary details lies a distant and a very hurting God and a very heavy message as well. It says, they also took away the pots, 
the shovels, the trimmers, the bowls, the spoons, and all the bronze utensils, and which the priest ministered, the basins, the fire pans, the bowls, the pots, the lampstand, the spoons, and the cups, whatever was solid gold and whatever was silver, the captain of the guard took away. Nothing was left. Nothing that linked Israel to God was left. Nothing that linked men to God was left. To a Jew living then, these must have been very, very painful details. It was the last stroke, the departure of God from Israel and other divorce. But was it all for nothing? Is it the end? I want to tell you, God is persistent. Not at all. The Bible does not end like this, and even Jeremiah does not really end like this. The Bible, again, is a book of love, as the four last verses clearly show. But before we conclude with these four last verses, let us go back to where we have left last week and see how these things, the information given to us, lead us, leads us to the end. You know, back in chapter 49, if you remember, after looking at Israel, God turned to the nations of the Middle East, those that surround Israel. Here we're going to be political. In fact, the prophets of God were political. Everything that touches the Middle East concerns God. We looked at Egypt. We looked at Philistia, which is modern-day Gaza Strip. We looked at Ammon, Moab, and Edom, which constitute modern Jordan. We saw the role they played and will play at the end. We remember that these were guilty of two main sins, the same as those nations that we'll cover today. The first major one is their disregard of the God of the Bible. That raised the question on revelation. When and how did God reveal himself to them? To Babylon, God said that they sinned against him. Did they know God? Did they know about him? Following God's, Paul's argument in Romans 1, besides nature and the law written in the heart of man, the prophets of God in the Bible spoke directly to these nations. Throughout history, many people of this nation recognized the God of the Bible. While many accepted him just like Ruth, many did not, such as Nebuchadnezzar, or later Cyrus, who knew the might and the strength of the God of the Bible, but did not follow him. As far as God is concerned, all nations, all men know about him. As the Bible says, there is no excuse at the end. The second sin that they were guilty of is their treatment of Israel. Israel past, Israel present, and Israel future. Future because these prophecies have a double reference. They have not yet finished their course. The next nation today is Syria, represented by Damascus. This is in Jeremiah 49, verses 23 to 27. Syria is the Greek term for the Hebrew Aram. Aram was the son of Shem, the father of the Aramean people, from where Rebekah, Isaac's wife, came from. There, these people were often clashing with the Israelites. Most of the time, they were at war with the Israelites. Today, while Syria is a fairly new state, by the way, it achieved independence from France only in 1947, Damascus is one of the oldest cities in the Middle East known as far back as Abraham, 4,000 years ago. The prophecy begins with the words, against Damascus. Nothing positive is prophesied for this part of the world. Jeremiah only speaks of its fall. At the, at the end, this country is described as being destroyed by fire. And it is Isaiah, the prophet, that speaks of its last stage. We read in Isaiah 17.1, the burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Today, Damascus is still standing, but suddenly it will be destroyed, as the prophet said. And as we speak today, there's a revolution in this country, which I believe will shape it for its role in the tribulation time, which will bring this judgment upon it. Jeremiah does not give the reason, the reason why of its fall. Another prophet, Amos, gives us one reason. It is because of their hatred, their mistreatment of the people of Israel. 
Nevertheless, God speaks of this city as the city of my joy. Would you see that in Jeremiah 45, 20, 49, 25? There is surely a remnant of believers there, such as in the New Testament, if you remember. Damascus was the home of Ananias, where Paul went after his conversion. Today, I am sure there's a body of believers in Syria we must pray for. The second part of the Middle East spoken of by the prophet is Kedar and Hazor, which is Saudi Arabia, Jeremiah 49, 28 to 33. This is modern Saudi Arabia, and notice that while Kedar is one country, Hazor is many countries. Notice how the prophecy begins in verse 28. Against Kedar and against the kingdoms of Hazor, these kingdoms may include its neighbors, such as Kuwait, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Oman, and Yemen. What is the origin of these countries? Kedar in Hebrew means dark, as one darkened by the sun. And this was the name of a son of Ishmael in Genesis 25, who established himself in this part of the world. Hazor actually means settlement. But see how these nations are described here in Jeremiah. The description fits so well their current state. Just one verse, verse 31. It says, Arise, go up to the wealthy nation that dwells securely, says Jehovah, which was neither gates, has neither gates nor bars, dwelling alone. Wealthy is what characterizes this part of the world today. This is the only nation spoken of this way. And in fact, today they are very wealthy because of oil. And the prophecy also says that they are dwelling alone, apart, far from the rest of the world, in desert, arid land. They are at rest. This wealth may be interpreted as the blessing from their God. Not so. The God of the Bible, he doesn't say so. In fact, these Arab nations were guilty, God says, of living at ease because that brought them to manifest their pride and arrogant self-confidence. Like with Edom, their riches and isolation made them think that they are apart from this world, untouchable, not so, says God. And these countries, especially Saudi Arabia, while rich and in isolation, did actually impact our world. One crucial development that characterizes it is Islam. It was there in Mecca that the Quran is said to have been revealed to Muhammad. We remember that one reason for judgment on the nation was their disregard of the God of the Bible. Saudi Arabia and its neighbor are in the first place in its contribution. In addition of having no words of commendation for these countries, the judgment on this part of the world is particularly severe. Just see the last two verses of this section, verse 32 to 33. It says, Their camels shall be for booty and the multitude of their cattle for plunder. I will scatter to all winds those in the furthest corners, and I will bring their calamity from all its size, says Jehovah. Hazor shall be a dwelling for jackals, who, a desolation forever. No one shall reside there. No son of man shall dwell there. This passage describes the total devastation of this part of the world by war until the inhabitants are scattered and dispersed all over the world. As for the land itself, it will be, says, forsaken forever. And notice the words jackals. In Hebrew, is tanaim. And we really do not know what that means. Some translations have jackals. KGV has jackals. Of course, the KGV has dragons. Others speak of it as a sea monster. Even some translation will give different meaning of this word in different passages. So we do not know what it means. The Septuagint translated by the Greek word for a large, dense multitude, like a constellation, but of what? We don't know. It is Isaiah the prophet in his chapter 13 who can help us determine what Tanaim is. He uses the same word to describe the demonic hordes that will dwell in Babylon after its destruction. The word Tanaim is among Isaiah's description of a demonic constellation. See how idolatry is directly linked to demonic worlds. 
We remember that while Egypt's desolation and dispersion will last only for a few years, for Saudi Arabia and its neighbors, it will last at least for a thousand years until the messianic times, until God creates a new heaven and a new earth. Jeremiah's prophecy has not yet happened. See this area today. It is booming. It is so much at ease. It is so rich. But the word says, no man shall dwell there eventually. The third country today is Elam. We see it in Jeremiah 49, verses 34 to 39. Elam referred to an area east of Babylon known today as modern Iran. While Iran is not an Arab country, it is linked with us here because of the same faith that fuels their hatreds against the Jews. See verse 36, as it speaks of its eventual destruction. He says, against Elam, I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and scatter them towards all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcast of Elam will not go. Jeremiah described the destruction of Elam with the inhabitants being completely dispersed all over the world. However, and like many other countries, it will be reestablished. Look at this beautiful verse, 39. I will set my throne in Elam and I will destroy from there the king of the princes, says the Lord, right? Iran will be restored. He, God says, I will set my throne in there. And notice what God says, I will destroy who, what particularly? Not the people, not the land. He says the leader, that one leader, the king and the other leaders. He says, who are the king and the leaders? I don't know. Those that will be there. And so far, looking at these countries as a whole, even after 2,500 years, not only these have not disappeared, but they are at the same spot as they were at the time of Jeremiah, with the same intentions as they had. For example, did you know that these were the same nations that attacked Israel when it just became a nation in 1948? Did you know that as soon as Israel proclaimed its independence in 1948, it was attacked by Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Saudi Arabia, and in addition to that, Lebanon. Roughly half a million Jews in Israel were surrounded by 40 million Arabs who were determined to drive the Jews to the sea. They were always there as if they were waiting for the prophecies for the Jews to return so they would block it. We also remember that several weeks before the war in 1967, it is Egypt who issued a postal stamp showing Nasser with a map of Israel in flame in his right hand. And during this war in 1967, we know that Egypt lined up 80,000 men, Syria, 40,000 men, Jordan, 40,000 men, Saudi Arabia, 20,000 men, and Iraq as well sent 5,000 troops to help Syria see that there is really nothing new in the Middle East. Now we turn to the last country, Babylon, modern-day Iraq. In Genesis, the first collective rebellion of man began with Babylon. In Jeremiah, the judgment of the nations ends with Babylon in the same way that it ends with Babylon in Revelation. Chapter 50 and 51 with a full 110 verses are devoted to it. Babylon is more than a city, it is more than a country, it is the ultimate rejection of God. What is prophesied there are really the details of the fall of Babylon. The one with when the Middle Persian destroyed it and its final fall at the end of the tribulation. I want to tell you where, what Carchemish was to Egypt and the destruction of Jerusalem to the Jews, so the destruction of Babylon with Cyrus was to the Babylonian. They never really recovered, but it must rise again because we see it standing in the book of Revelation 17 and 18. Whether one believes that literal Babylon will resurrect or not, its concept, its influence never died. And this is what needs to be destroyed before the messianic times comes. Let's see what Jeremiah says. First, for us to realize the magnitude of the influence of Babylon, let me bring you to one verse, Jeremiah 51, 48. See what it says will happen after the destruction of the city, or this concept, or this rebellion. 
Jeremiah 51, 48 says, Then the heavens and the earth and all that is in them shall sing joyously over Babylon. For the plunderer shall come to her from the north, says the Lord. Big, isn't it? You have all the heavens and the earth who will sing when this country, this concept, if you want, will be destroyed. This is how strong and powerful its influence is. And let me remind you one more time that in the Bible, the word Babylon doesn't really exist, right? Both the Hebrew and the Greek agree and always say Babel. Babel, never Babylon. This is in the original. Why a translator decided to change Babel to Babylon, I'm not sure. But if the original word Babel is respected, then it will readily give us an idea, the right idea of what is behind this concept. The theme of Babel really is rebellion against God. Remember that the Tower of Babel was built because men wanted to reach the skies. That is, they wanted to reach the skies to dethrone God. This is where man-made religion began. Babel means the gate of God or man-made God. I want to tell you that the building of this tower has never ended. See how Jeremiah refers even to it in Jeremiah 51.9. It says, For her judgment reaches the heaven and is lifted up to the skies. Instead of men wisdom and achievement, and instead of men replacing God, what succeeded really is to anger God. Because it says the judgment has reached that time. That is heaven. And there are two reasons, always the same ones, that God gives for their stern judgment. The first is the Tower of Bible. That is the pride. Pride. Look at Jeremiah 50, verse 31 and 32. Jeremiah 50, 31 and 32. It says, Behold, I am against you, O most hofty one, says the Lord God of hosts, for your day has come, the time that I will punish you. The most proud shall humble and fall, and no one will raise him up. I will kindle a fire in his city, and it will devour all around him. These people were the instruments of God, by the way, to punish Israel, but they became so proud, right? And they abused their power. Now is their turn, God says. What does this pride translate to? There's something that God says here where we can see the real cause and effect of pride. This is, I want to put it on the screen for you. It's in Jeremiah 50, 24 and 14. In 24, it says, because... You have contended against the Lord, Jehovah, right? Even more, the last words of verse 14, for she has sinned against the Lord. This is what pride will make you do. It will make you fight against God. But how did they contend with a God they presumably did not know? Again, notice that in both verses, you have the name of what? Jehovah. The name of that the God of, um, of the Bible has. That is almost his proper name. We may think they did not know him, but they did not know him. These people were polytheists and always in search of a better God to add to their collection. They took them all, but they didn't want to take the real one. You know why? Because the real one asked them to confess their sins. The real one asked them to confess their pride. This is not what they wanted. But most importantly, let me tell you that if the Babylonians and all these nations are going to be counted accountable to Jehovah, how much more the people today who are surrounded by a constant influence of the word of God, how much more will the judgment be? As Jesus said, remember in Mark 6, 11, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than in the day of judgment than for that city. What about our city? This should bring us really to double our effort to bring the word of God. What about Montreal? What about the other cities where are standing godly churches and godly people who share their faith? I tell you, the Babylonians will make them look really little at the, the day of judgment. And see whom God is saying he won the war against. Right at the start, Jeremiah 50 verse 2. He goes right to the core of the matter here. 
So declare the nations, proclaim and set up a standard, proclaim, do not conceal it. Say Babylon is taken, Baal is ashamed. Merodach is broken in pieces. Her idols are humiliated. Her images are broken in pieces. This is a war of gods here. Who is Merodach or Marduk? Marduk is the head of the Babylonian pantheon and was worshipped by Nebuchadnezzar, by the Assyrian, and notably by Cyrus the Great. God begins by saying to them, you know, your gods that you believed in are nothing. I won over them. See how idolatry is linked with rebellion and it is linked with pride. It is all in the same family. The other reason is the same given to the, all the other nations in verse 11 of Jeremiah 50. It says, because you were glad, because you rejoiced, you destroyed my heritage, God says, because you have grown fat like a heifer, threshing grain. Because they went against Israel and they abused their power. And in verse 49 of Jeremiah 51, I'll read it for you. It says, as Babylon has caused the slain of, of Israel to fall, so at Babylon the slain of all the earth shall fall. This has prophetic element in there. It's talking about the end time where all the nations are going to gather in the Middle East. Israel treatment by the nation will be the subject of a judgment, especially the one in the valley of Jehoshaphat that we find in Matthew 25, when Jesus will gather all the nations of the world to assess what they did to his brethren, the Jews. Babylon, the final, its final judgment is very severe. It will be destroyed, it says, forever. See how Jeremiah speaks of his destruction. Verses we're going to look at are a good example of a double reference prophecy. What is a double, pro uh, double reference prophecy? It simply says that many Old Testament prophecies have both a partial fulfillment in their day and a complete fulfillment in the distant future. See Jeremiah 50 verse 3. It says, For out of the north a nation comes up against her, which shall make her land desolate, and no one shall dwell there therein. They shall move, they shall depart, both men and beast. Jeremiah was really talking about the Medo Persian invasion of Babylon in the first part of the verse. They captured Babylon in 539, but they did not destroy the city as it is explained in this verse. The second part of the verse never happened. It says, no one will dwell there. I went on the internet and I saw a picture of Babylon today. They're there. People are still living in this country. No one shall dwell therein, God said. It's still in the future. See again Jeremiah 50, 13. It says, because of the wrath of God, she shall not be inhabited, but she shall be wholly desolate. Everyone who goes by Babylon shall be horrified. Look at verse 39. Again, it says, Therefore, the wild desert beast shall dwell there with the jackals, and the ostriches shall dwell in, in it. It shall be inhabited no more forever, nor shall be dwelt in from generation to generation. These, again, are not animals at all. The jackal, the ostriches, some translated as wolves and ostriches, others as wild beasts and owls. Hyenas and ostriches, they don't know. They obviously did not know what they were, and comparing Isaiah with Revelation, we understand them to be descriptions or names of demons. This is not only the destruction of Babel, it is a destruction of pride. It is yet to come. And see how God calls Babylon again, Jeremiah 51, 41. You've got to recognize the word over there. Jeremiah 41, that is 51, 41. He says, oh, how Sheshach is taken. Oh, how the praise of the whole earth is seized. Do you remember what Sheshach means? Here, the last letter of the alphabet. In fact, I will show you here. The last letter of the alphabet is substituted for the first one and so on. So the later letter, ABC, is ZYX. So that Babylon is completely seen upside down. That's the tower upside down, right? Sheshak. This is what it is. 
And there's another word that God names Babylon with. It is a new word in the Bible, nowhere seen. Look at verse 21, 50, 21. You have it in the screen as well. It says, go up against the Merathaim, against it, and against the inhabitant of Pekok. Merathaim, that's a new word in the Bible. What does it mean? It means repeated rebellion. This is what it is, from the word Mara, right? Again and again and again. This is what happened since the creation of the nations. They are Merathaim. This is what stands on the other side of God's repeated pleas of salvation. See how these things are linked? Again, the prophet Samuel said in 1 Samuel 5.22 that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Right? And vice versa, right? We could say that witchcraft, idolatry, is the sin of rebellion. Once I read something about the human body that really made me understand the, the, and ponder about the the meaning of rebellion. You know, in any flesh and bones body, there are a variety of cells. There are nerve cells, blood cells, muscle cells, and many others, each having a distinct function. The body operates smoothly, not because the cells get together and they vote on what they ought to do, but because each one was designed to do a special task. It is the function of the head to bring all these different functions together so that the body operates effectively as each cell gives itself to the task of functioning according to the design. Certainly the body would not operate properly if its cells chose to do whatever they want their own way. Do you know what we call a rebellion of cells in the stomach? And digestion. A revolt of the brain cells is called insanity. Anytime the cells in our bodies don't operate properly, it means that the body is sick, that something is wrong with it. Many of the problems in our lives and in our congregation are a result of our forgetting that we work as a body together for the same cause. And when one cell, one member decides to do what they want, then we have an indigestion. In the same way, when our old nature takes over and win, we have a spiritual and digestion. This is at the core of rebellion. This is at the core of pride. In the same line, there is one verse that sends, stands out in this section, one really beautiful verse. I want you to read it. This is Jeremiah 51, 9. One that really speaks about the work we are to do. One we need to ponder on. Jeremiah 51, 9. He says, we would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her, let us go everyone to his own country, for her judgment reaches the heaven and is lifted up to the skies. Listen to what he says. We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Who is speaking here, by the way? And how would Babylon be healed? Those who speak here are the Israelites, the remnant of Israel, as the next verse tells us. But in what way could they have healed Babylon? And what does it mean to heal Babylon? Remember, in chapter 29, the letter of Jeremiah to the people of Babylon, what did he say to them? Seek the peace of the city where you have been caused to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for it is peace. You will have peace. That was the role of the Israelites while they were in the diaspora to bless and to pray for the people who took them away captive. And it seems that the remnant of Israel did this. But she, Babylon, is not healed, the passage tells us. Maybe if it would have been Nineveh, she perhaps would have repented because Nineveh was healed at least for a generation. Egypt and Iran and part of Jordan are going to be healed because they're going to come back to the God of Israel. Not so Babel. There is no letting go of pride itself. And Babylon, more than any other of its neighbor, did have more, I believe, of the testimony of God. Now, this is important for us to see. You know that back then, we realized that the remnant of Israel had their, in their possession important knowledge of the future of the country they were in. They had important information of the future of Babylon. They knew of Babylon's outcome. 
They knew from Isaiah, they knew from Daniel that the Middle Persian Empire was coming, and they knew the name of the leader even before he was born, Cyrus. God gave them this knowledge not for their own pleasure, but surely so that they could share it with the Babylonians, and so the Babylonians may come to a saving knowledge of God, realizing how great he is. You know that when Isaiah, if you remember, mentioned the name of Cyrus, he did it some 175 years before Cyrus was born. This is why they think that Isaiah was written by 100,000 different Isaiahs. And the Jews had this word in their hands. And they had the great prophet Daniel in their midst. They had enough to turn Babylon into a new Israel. But it seems that the Babylonians refused. But I'm sure that many accepted. It is interesting to see that what the Jews did in captivity, they couldn't do it in freedom, right? To be the priestly nation. We, we also know now how that is in our possession, us today, a deep and exact knowledge of many facets of the future, don't we? We have the book of Revelation. What are we going to do with it? This is, I believe, the strong message that we find in Jeremiah. We know about Russia, we know about Iran, and we know about Turkey. We know about Europe, and we know about Asia. There are enough prophecies to know what's going to happen. We know about the Middle East, as Jeremiah tells us. Are we going to do something with this powerful knowledge that is given to us? Today, I want to tell you, we have much more than Daniel in our midst. We have the Spirit of God in us, and we have the knowledge of the Spirit of God, and we are living in the end times. Are we healing our neighbors? Are we healing our city? Are we using the power of God to bless the people outside and to heal them? I remember there was an ad once by Bell Telephone for the Yellow Pages. This is what it says. It says, born to be battered, the loving phone call book. Underline it, circle it, write in the margins, turn down page corners. The more you use it, the more valuable it gets to be. This is hard to believe that the yellow pages will come to be so powerful to someone, but this is very true of the Bible. And you know what? We're not allowed to keep it for ourselves. We need to share it, we need to love, and we need to heal the people. And do you know that we have the power to heal? I'm not talking about physical healing, but much more than that spiritual healing, we have the remedy. We have the means, we know how, we know the source, so we must use this power. And practically speaking, how can we get hold of the power of this power so we can use it properly? We need to be healed first. The same power we use for others, we can use for our lives. We have to know how. One famous doctor once said, he says, for death is the cure of all diseases. This is an exaggeration and a pessimistic one. However, in the spiritual realm, this is very true. True healing comes when we die to ourselves. And this takes a lifetime of work. This doesn't happen like this. Healing begins when the self, the killing of that side of ourselves, is done so that our true being emerges in God, our Creator. Now suppose our physical body is never healed. Just imagine, right? We carried with us all through life the scraps, the, 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 the cuts, the bruises of childhood, and everyday accidents. We're going to look like a very old punching bag, right? We will be battered. We will not be recognizable. Thank God for the healing power of the body. But what about our, um, our emotions, our spiritual condition? They are people who never heal emotionally. They carry with them through life the emotional bruises that could be healed. Worse, there are others who experience no spiritual healing in the inner person, though it is readily available through our Lord and Savior, Yeshua. You know, there's a proverb that Jesus used himself in Luke. He says, physicians, heal yourself. We often apply the right formulas, the right doctrines for others. We can see clearly what's happening there, but we need to use them in our lives. We are the physicians. 
we have the remedy of sin and for a better life for us and for others. Now, how does the book of Jeremiah ends? The book ends with a touch of grace. Uh, excuse me, more than a touch. A pouring out of grace and of forgiveness. It could not have ended in a more beautiful way. Here we see the spirit of forgiveness that we all need and of promise, and of love, and of grace. And this is seen in the last four verses of the book. Let's read them together. And let's see where the grace is in there. Verse 31 to 34. It says, Now it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Joachim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 12th of the 25th day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoashim, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoashim changed from his prison garments, and he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And as for his provisions, there was a regular ration given to him by the king of Babylon, a portion for each day until the day of his death. All the days of his life. Where is the grace? Where is the forgiveness in there? Now, did you know who Jehoashim was? Remember Coniah? Remember Jeconiah, in, in especially Jeremiah 22? It was because of the wickedness of this man that the lineage of the Messiah, actually through Solomon, was interrupted. His name is mentioned in Matthew chapter 1. Because of him... And his predecessors as well. The Messiah could not come from the line of Solomon. This is why we have two genealogies in the New Testament. If it was left to Jehoashim, Jesus could never have come. Yet God forgives the man and he reestablishes re him to a better life. This is the true spirit of forgiveness. If God forgave this man and did not add up all his transgressions, I can tell you, he can forgive you whatever you did. This is how the book ends. And while not one of Jeconiah's descendants could sit on David's throne, you know that good men came out from him, right? Remember Zerubbabel? That was from this man. He brought the Jews back to Israel. He was one of them. And who else? Joseph, the righteous husband of Mary. He comes from this man. And see how the Lord reestablishes what we may see as the most wicked man. This reestablishment follows so much, I want to tell you, if you look at it closely, the process of salvation. First, God delivers him, verse 31, right? It was the new king of Babylon who lifted up the head of Jehoashim, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. Such is salvation. We are first brought out of prison and lifted up. Next, he comforts him. Verse 32, he spoke kindly to him. Such would the king of kings do to those who entrust their lives in the God of the Bible. Third, we see, he exalted him. Verse 32, and he gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. Such will be those who believe in Yeshua. They will be exalted much more than what we read here. Jesus promised, if you remember in Revelation 3.21, he says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, he said. This is the zenith of exaltation, by the way. See now what comes, verse 33. So Jehoashim changed from his prison garments. He changed his prison garment just like for the believer, when our salvation will be completed, Yeshua says in Revelation 3, 5, He who overcomes, I will clothe in white garments. That means all sins will be forgiven, they will be forgotten. And this is not all. The next thing we read of Jehoashim is that he is honored by the king for the rest of his life. Verse 33, and he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. For the believer, this honor will be for eternity. Forever and ever we shall be with God in the new Jerusalem. And guess what? We're going to eat, among other things, I believe. Revelation 2.7. He who overcomes, Jesus says, 
I will give to it of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. More than that, can't ask. And lastly, Joachim was given a continual and daily allowance for the rest of his life. It was an allowance, not a reward, because there was nothing that this king did to gain any privilege. And this is so true for us today. If God forgave and took such care of Jeconiah, how much more would he take care of you? He will do the same for all those who come to him. Very few of us may have done worse thing than this man, Jeconiah. Yet forgiveness has no limit with God. Grace is truly a difficult and perhaps impossible for us concept to understand. I want to tell you that when a person works an eight-hour day and receives a fair day's pay for his time, this is why we call this a wage. When a person competes with an opponent and receives a trophy for his performance, we call this a prize. When a person receives appropriate recognition for his long service or high achievement, we call this what? An award. When a person receives appropriate recognition for all these things, he gets what he deserves. And when a person is not capable of earning a wage, can win no prize and deserves no reward, yet receives such a gift anyway, this is what we call God's unmerited favor, which is grace itself. This is what we all need. This is what we mean when we talk about the grace of God, the salvation of God. This, I want to tell you what the book of Jeremiah leaves us with. To conclude, what are some of the major points we have learned from Jeremiah? I will mention only a couple more because we definitely do not have the time to enumerate all of them. In addition to the one we just mentioned, God's grace and forgiveness, we can think of God's absolute sovereignty. This we shall not forget. Jeremiah 50, verse 44, God says, Who is like me? Who will reign me? And who is that shepherd who will withstand me? No one, absolutely no one. What this book teaches us is that God is in full control even when we're in the pit, just like Jeremiah is here. I doubt, I doubt very much that we will come to experience such drastic changes and persecution as Jeremiah and as the Israelites did at that time. Yet God had every single detail in control. Third, God never forgets what you do for him. Never. The best investment of our time and of all that we possess should be invested in God first. He did not forget the work, remember, of the Ethiopian, Ebed Melech, who brought Jeremiah out of the pit. What did he say to him? He went back to him while the Babylonians were surrounding the city. And he says, you know what? I will, not I will not forget you. I will deliver you. He also remembered Baruch. Remember Baruch, the scribe, the one who was writing everything that Jeremiah would say. He devoted a whole chapter 45 for him. And he says, Baruch, don't worry. I'm with you. Lastly for today, we have seen how our Messiah is so present in all the pages of Jeremiah. Not only in the grace and affliction of God that is so often voiced, but in the life of Jeremiah himself. This book, I want to tell you, is a great exposition of Isaiah 53. It must have been the words of Jeremiah that followed the Messiah to the cross. We read at the end of his ministry, of the ministry of the Messiah in the gospel in the book of Matthew, just before his final crucifixion. We read of Matthew 27, 9 to 10. It says, Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And it took the thirty pieces of silver, the value of him who was pierced, whom they and the children of Israel pierced, priced, and gave them to the potter's field, as the Lord's directed. Jeremiah never specifically said these words. But he said it and demonstrated them in so many words and action. This is the whole book of Jeremiah right here. The main message I want to tell you of the book of Jeremiah is about the life of the Messiah. How he suffered, how he persecuted and rejected, was rejected. Yet at the end, he resurrects, he forgives. And I love the last words here. 
as the Lord directed, as the Lord directed. Let us pray. Uh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this great revelation that we have in this book of Jeremiah. We've seen how patient, how loving you are towards us all. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, for taking care, care of each one of us. We may not always recognize your hand on us, but your word that you said you have put above your name testifies of these things for us. Let us realize that we are always under the shadow of your wings. And today, Lord, we wish to be really lost in you. Lord, visit our congregation. Touch each and everyone here today. And do not let any of us lose our first love. Teach us even more your ways. Teach us common sense as you define it. Give us of your wisdom for raising our children, for solving our problems, for investing our time and things that we have in the priorities that are yours. Help us to see life in the light of eternity and see you in the light of your word, that we might become as solid as works, as wise as serpents, and harmless as dove. This we pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. To get in touch with us, you can do so by telephone, 1-888-685-5902. Locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. 5902. You can also reach us through our website at www.arielcanada.com. Again, the phone number is 1-888-685-5902 or locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. Website address is www.arielcanada, all one word, A-R-I-E-L, Canada.com. Be blessed. Shalom.